Hey all, you know I'm the data guy and there's a lot of great data coming out lately. So I'm going to do a short here and answer the biggest question of all. You know, what about the mRNA kind of effectiveness and cost benefit? Well, uh, Dr. Claire Craig had an excellent thread recently, straight from the UK government uh, publications, and everything in here will be published government data, right? So no censorship, uh, but it's fantastic and very insightful. And I'm going to add in a little bit more data that I have been sharing since late 20, early 21. And it, at a very early stage, began to answer the question of cost benefit around mass medication campaigns, including coercion and uh, kind of mandates and stuff we should never see in a civilized society. But in any case, enjoy this little bit of analysis. Yep, there's nothing I love more than published data. Hope you like my splash screen also. But anyway, we're going to make a very important quick point here. There's the link to Metatron Substack. And this data was released possibly mistakenly by the Canadian authorities way back. And it just shows a key point that in the first 14 days post uh, the V, you have a relatively large hump, right? of hospitalizations for whatever reason <laughs> and after that they fall off so the first 14 days post the v is a very important clocking up of maybe half of the hospitalizations you'd be interested in this crucial period and for mortality it was similar the deaths uh, with a positive pcr the first 14 days post the v was a very important period we clocked up a lot of data now, this is a crucial thing to recognize because it can lead to magic. In other words, if you take out the first 14 days post the V from your data, you can create an utterly artificial data set. And I think that's been happening all across uh, publications and even government data. It was excused by saying, well, they're not really V'd in the first 14 days, so we'll just ignore that. But then you're ignoring all the data. Uh, it's quite shocking. So let's keep this in mind and we'll go ahead. Now, just one other quick word on Professor Fenton way back at the start of 22 and through the uh, six month follow up of the Pfizer Moderna trials or RCTs. And these are the only things that can give you proof of benefit in mortality or hospitalization, etc. But they didn't really look for that in these trials. Uh, they looked more at how many people caught COVID. But he went through the data and it was fascinating. And I'll call out the uh, mortality here. And the deaths were higher, for what it's worth, in the V arm versus placebo. It wasn't statistically significant, but still kind of shocking that it wouldn't show some reduction, even non-statistically significant. So that's a big fail because only the RCT can give us real evidence of benefit. The associational real world data sadly is confounded to the moon and back. So it's almost meaningless due to that confounding. The thing they did show, which is what they were going for, was only 85 caught COVID in the V-arm and 924 in the placebo arm. Now, this struck me at the time as extraordinary from all my immunology people who said the mechanisms of this technology, you wouldn't expect anything like uh, this effect. So that's really weird. And I thought, hmm, how'd you conjure that? But again, there can be magic because the first two weeks after the V, you dump the data. So you can generate these differences just by that mechanism alone. And God knows what other ones we're, we're not really even sure. But over the next few years, the data will be shared and maybe we'll find out. So it's important to note that in mid-21, Israel data showed the same percent of cases in the VED as the general population feed. So in other words, there was no signal in real world uh, from the V. Now that contradicts quite a lot, this massive difference in the RCT. So it kind of re-emphasizes the point that this is weird and you can only assume magic helped it come to pass. So, Dr. Claire Craig just released a thread on Twitter. It's superb, and it's data out from the UK government. References there, so like everything here, 
cannot be censored because it's published data. And they've done the only calculation that matters to patients. And I agree 100%. And the answer is not pretty. And it's about cost benefit. And she pulls out one example from the data. And here it is for a booster for normal people age 40 to 49, almost a million people would have to get the V, uh, the third dose of V, if you will, in order for one severe hospitalization to be putatively avoided. Now, that's nuts because at a rough thought, that's a million by, I don't know, say 50 bucks, that's $50 million worth of gear to maybe avoid one severe hospitalization in that group. But remember, there's magic in these figures, which makes them look way better than they are. And one example is the first 14-day gig. So it's just insane. It makes no sense for people under 60 whatsoever, mathematically, financially, ethically, qualitatively, or any E. This is absurd without even getting into talking about side effects and all that stuff. So she pulls out another example that even in over 70 years, right, for the primary, the main first two vaccinations, right, besides boosters, only (laughs) two and a half thousand need to be medically treated to prevent purportedly a single ICU admission. And this is the best possible case you can make, the most key cohort, primary V. And that's just absurd. And you've got to remember that even this number, you would expect to be much, much higher if there wasn't some magic in the 14-day stuff. So that's around, let me see, for the two vaccinations and administration, I suppose that's around a quarter of a million dollars, roughly, to potentially for one aged ICU admission avoid it that that makes no sense it it just makes no sense and that's with figures that are no doubt confounded and biased to the better because of the uh, magic so there you go and you can pull any other cases out of here 30 to 39 years old for the primary major two v's one in a third of a million uh, to avoid a severe hospitalization and that's medications. So if you multiply that by around 100 bucks, let's say, that's $30 million. I can't be doing that right. It can't be $30 million to supposedly prevent one severe hospitalization. But do the math, and the money here is off of this planet. It's just astonishing. Just the math. You don't need to get into side effects and depopulation of deaths. You don't need to do that. Just glance at the math and it makes zero sense across the whole gamut, except for extreme cases of exposed people or elderly. But even then, it doesn't make sense. She also notes, quite amusingly, that from pharma's own guidelines, in terms of rare or very rare and rates, the chance of a benefit from taking the drugs for a 70-year-old avoiding ICU was rare by their definitions. Chance even for a primary course for anyone under 60 was very rare. You know, there we have it. And that's with the benefit of a little bit of data magic making things look better than they most likely are. And if you do mention the harms, you're allowed to mention them if it's published data. But the harms in this trial, and the links are there, I'll share the tweet thread below so you can click on the links and go to the uh, publications. The UK government have now said for 12 to 15 year olds, 162,000 would need to be injected to avoid a single ICU. And the risk in other publications is 1 in 10,000 for that group for myocarditis. And that's just one of the adverse events. So no matter how you feel about how big the adverse events are, none of this makes sense. And the benefits benefit from a bit of data magic like I described. Whereas the risks are pretty much probably underestimated in general, as the BMJ pointed out quite some time back. So the risk-benefit equation is absurd. And she notes that the figures were discussed on 8th November last by the panel in the UK, who generally push and recommend for booster campaigns. They knew this data made zero sense, 
but they never stopped. And it might be, as Dr. John Campbell said, these panels, official kind of government bodies that drive campaigns, they're around 86% of their income comes directly from industry. So it might have something to do with it. I'm not saying it does, but it's an interesting bit of data. So I happened to say in late 20 or early 21, way back at the start, I looked at the, I think this was New England Journal of Medicine analysis of the Israel campaign because they were the vanguard of going out and being everybody. And they got these figures and said, oh yeah, yeah, it looks like it's good. But for severe illness, they had, if you normalize it to a million people, around 100 in the VED and around 300 in the unVED. I mean, these are tiny differences. Now, it was only over a couple of months post the V, but remember that these figures from February 2021, when I went through this, they have magic in them because the paper did say the first two weeks after the V was ignored. So already they're confounded or biased to a positive result, but still the numbers are kind of pathetic. Severe illness avoided 200 and death avoided 32 per million people over that couple of months. And if you do the numbers for that, you're talking incredible figures for deaths deferred and severe illness avoided. Now over a longer period, these numbers will fall, but the reality is we know there's magic in how they're defined. So rough and tough from a high level, I just pointed out in early 21 that this made no mathematical sense, whatever about all the side effect and harm discussion, which would confound it even further. So there are the numbers, guys, and New England Journal of Medicine, you know, all published. And I'll remind you from the same Israel, we saw that at least in terms of cases, there was nothing showing up in differences. Uh, so you got to have just huge questions around this. So bottom line for me, even staying out of the side effects and all that kind of arguments, you know, this whole year or two of kind of madness that made no mathematical sense or, or ethical sense or kind of health sense on dollars per life saved, etc. The whole thing for me was just one big roller coaster ride of pharma magic. As always, pouring through the data, exploring what's going on in the world and sharing uh, non-misinformation, but clarity and opposing corporate and legacy media misinformation is what I'm all about. So huge appreciation for all the support that I've gotten over the last few years from all of you out there and really appreciate anyone else who can kind of get involved and help investigative, scientific, data-centric journalism of sorts get out there and help people understand what's going on in the world today. Because, as I always say, or acknowledge, I should say, legacy media and corporate-sponsored media has let us down so badly now, it's an absolute tragedy. And uh, we've got to counter that with proper, correct information and data inference and correct scientific kind of conclusions from what the actual data is saying. So thank you.